are doing. It's uh, week six, it's Monday. We are halfway done, basically, except we have a little item to take care of later this week. As you know, we've got a midterm Thursday night, so I hope you guys are starting to think about that, look forward to that, study for that. Two practice exams posted. I might post one more practice exam before Thursday. Um, there's lots of other problems, though, even if you finish the practice exams. Go to your section handouts if you want more problems. Uh, go to the code step-by-step -step website if you want more problems. Go to the end of the chapters in the textbook. There's lots of problems. You can even Google for old quarters websites of 106X or B. They, have, they sometimes have other example problems. There's lots of problems out there. Hopefully you're not gonna run out of problems to practice with. Practicing is good. Practice as much as you can between now and Thursday night. Um, I'm gonna send you guys some messages probably tonight or else tomorrow morning. Uh, we're going to split up because um, we actually have to take the test in a couple of different rooms. We're not going to be in here. And so where we're going to go for the actual exam Thursday night is going to be split by alphabet, like last name. I'm going to send everybody messages where you need to go. And uh, I will also post it on the class webpage. I'll post it on the Piazza. I'll post it. I'll send email to you. So hopefully everybody will know where they need to go. Uh, we haven't quite finished figuring that out yet, but we'll know by tomorrow, I think. Uh, so, okay, uh, that's the exam. Did you guys have any other exam-related uh, questions or anything? I mean, I'm not going to do an exam review today, per se, but I um, just wanted to see if anybody was any questions about it or anything. No? Okay, well, you know how to find me if you have such a question later. Uh, yeah? So, does the exam cover like, uh, linked lists as well? Does the exam cover linked list? Um, yeah, I mean, I think of it as end of last week is the range. Um, I would probably be more likely to give you a, like, in terms of linked lists, I'd probably be more likely to give you a question of here's the nodes before, here's the nodes after. I want you to turn this picture into that picture, as opposed to the section problems from late last week of, like, write a method uh, on a linked list. So that's what I'd be more likely to do on the real test. Uh, and actually, what I'm going to cover this week, starting today, will not be on the midterm. So, of course, all of you are going to not pay any attention to me today, right? But um, you'll need it for your homework assignments, and you'll need it for the final, and still need to know it, but just not on Thursday, right? Um, any other questions about the exam before I start my, my content for today? Yeah? When is homework five due? When is homework five due? It's due a week from Wednesday. So uh, my intention, it, I'm going to put up the new assignment either tonight or tomorrow morning. My intention is that you wouldn't think about it at all until after the test, like this coming weekend here would be when you would maybe start to look at it. And hopefully you'll still have plenty of time. Some people find the middle of the quarter, either because of me or because of all your other <coughs> obligations, is a mess and it's busy. This might be a time you want to use a late day down here and wait till this Friday or the next Monday to turn in homework five. That's up to you. Um, yeah, anyway, that's our general schedule. So, okay, let's talk about the content for today. Um, kind of switching gears a little bit, we've been talking about linked lists all last week. And today I wanna to talk about how to build classes and objects in C++. And I don't know, maybe that seems like a weird topic change, you know, like uh, almost Family Guy-esque jump to something that has nothing to do with the content that came before it or something like that. But um, I do think it sort of relates to what we were covering because if you, if you look at the code that we wrote last week, I have that code here in Qt Creator, we wrote all these functions to do manipulations on a linked list. And all the functions, you had to pass in basically the front of the list and you had to pass in some other parameters of what you want to do, like add this value or search for this or remove that or whatever, right? This is fine. I mean, we've got a lot of these methods to, to work using this style, but that's not really how you do it, right? Like all the collections in the Stanford library, they don't work like this. They are written as classes of objects, like a vector is an object, a hash map is an object, you create one, you declare one, and then inside that object it has a bunch of functions, a bunch of methods that do all the useful behaviors of that collection, right? So I would like to learn how to uh, teach you guys how to do that in C++ so that we could maybe turn this functionality into a linked list class, okay? That's the way that you would do it in C++. So that's the connection. <laughs> See, so it's not totally unrelated to last week's content. I think anybody who implements a data structure would do it as a class. 
that's what we're going to learn how to do. Now, um, I, uh, since this is X, you know, I guess I would assume that several of you have already implemented classes before in another language. Could you please raise your hand if you've implemented classes of objects before? Yeah, most of you have. Okay, I'm, a lot of times, you know, I tell you whether I assume this or that about your previous knowledge. I'm going to try to operate under the assumption that you have seen classes and objects before because that's kind of like 106A material. Um, I'm going to review them a little, but I'm going to kind of try to mostly focus on what's different about C++ classes, both in the syntax and the behavior, okay? So here we go. And if you want to read about objects, they come from chapter six. So again, the goal here is I want to write a class called linked list. Actually, I'm going to call ours linked int list because it stores ints. Also because I don't want to collide with the name of the actual linked list class from the Stanford libraries. But anyway, we're going to write a linked list class and our class is going to have all these methods in it. And the list itself is going to be a, uh, an object that stores a pointer to the front. And the front is a sequence of nodes. And so it's going to sort of manage. I mean, the, I guess the way you could think of it is that all these functions we wrote, where you pass front, 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 instead, the, the object will store front. And then all these methods, I no longer have to pass it as a parameter because it's stored inside the, the object itself. That's the plan. So OK, first, I'm going to back up and learn about classes in general. So again, what's a class? I think you guys know this. A class is a type of objects, a template for a type of objects. It specifies what goes in that type, what data it stores, what behavior it stores. If you're not very familiar with classes and objects, I would suggest going and reading chapter six of the book, because I'm not going to cover in full detail what a class is and so forth. Go take a look at chapter six. Read it over. Um, so like, there's lots of classes in C++ already. <laughs> Um, you could make new ones depending on what your program is that you're writing. If you're doing a calendar or event planner, you could write a date class. If you're doing student registration system, you might write a student class or a course class or a teacher class. If you're doing a financial system, you might write a bank account class, etc. Right? World of Warcraft game you're implementing, you might have an orc class and a human class. Or I don't know what all the panda bear class and Pandora. I don't know what all the, I'm, I'm a little behind on my Warcraft. I don't know what all the races are. Um, Zerg, Protoss, something, I don't know. Um, what? Yes, I know, that's a different game. Um, so a class is a type of object, so what's an object? An object is an entity that stores data and has behavior. Mixture of data and behavior, okay? And data basically is represented as variables, and behavior is represented as methods or functions, and the object kind of puts those things together. So that's important, you want both of those things together. And I think just in general, the idea of object-oriented programming is where most of your code involves objects that do work and talk to other objects to help them. In main in C++, it's not an object, and it's not object-oriented, but if main creates an object to do a lot of fancy things, like a G window or a vector, and if that G window creates a G oval and the G oval creates a G rectangle or whatever, then most of the code is actually being done by objects, and so you could say that that was an object-oriented program. Um, one of the biggest reasons we like having classes and objects is because it provides a concept called abstraction. Maybe you've heard that word before. Of course, the idea there is that you don't always have to know all the details about how something works in order to use it. Um, lots of real world examples. I have no idea what's going on inside this gadget of mine, but it works fine. I know how to use it. I don't have to crack it open, understand the circuit boards and all that stuff, right? Um, you know, all kinds of examples like that in, in life. Um, a class is the same way. If I tell you what methods a class has, you actually don't need to go read the code to see how the class is implemented. As long as you understand what it'll do, and what functions are available, you can use it, right? So that's a nice thing. Uh, uh, it gives you a layer of abstraction in a program. And of course, I don't have to convince you of this. You've been taking advantage of it all quarter. You have no particular idea how a hash map works yet, probably, but you've been using it a lot, so there you go. Um, okay, so what goes in a class? Uh, data which we store as variables, we call them member variables. You might have heard a different term for that, like instance variables or fields, or basically every programming language makes up another name for this thing. <laughs> what you call the variables that get stored inside of an object. Technically, the name you're supposed to call that in C++ is member variables. I hear a lot of people, like I think most of the section leaders call them instance variables. So whatever, right? Pick your favorite term. Um, the functions, the behavior that live inside of an object, we call those member functions. A lot of people call those methods for short. Um, I have said, I think, in the past that like a lot of times languages will just come up with new names for the same thing. And I think on the first day of class or second day or whatever, I said that like Java calls functions methods. You know, the, the functions and methods are kind of the same, but function is what C++ calls it. 
and method is what Java calls it. That's mostly true, except I think technically, if you want to get real nitpicky about your terminology, a function is supposed to be something that's not related to any particular object, whereas a method is supposed to be something that lives inside of an object. So I think it's technically OK to call the functions inside of an object methods, uh, although the C++ term in the language standard is member functions. Okay. Um, one of the things that's important about these member functions, as you might have already learned, is that the member functions of an object can interact with the data of that object. Like if a bank account has a balance variable inside of it, and you write a deposit method, the depositing money can interact with the balance of that bank account that you call the method on. So that's an important idea. And we'll talk about that. Uh, and then usually in a class you also have a constructor where uh, you can initialize the state of the object as it's being created, as it's being born. You can pass in some parameters or set some settings and then the object will be ready to use. Right? So my assumption is that this is new, or not new to you, except for maybe the terminology. The concepts are not new, I hope, mostly. Right? So far so good? Any question, comments so far? Is that my microphone? I don't know. Um, OK, so let's, let's try to talk about the C++ version of all this stuff. In C++, when you write a class, you typically write two files. You write a .h file and a .cpp file. Remember how all the way back to the start of the class, we learned how you can declare a prototype for a function with a semicolon, and then later you can write the body of the function with the curly braces? That's basically what this separation is. You can declare what your class's name is and what all of its functions are and kind of all the contents that it has with semicolons in a .h file. And then you can write the body of how those functions are implemented with curly braces in a .cpp file. Technically, you could put all that code into one file. It's considered better style to split them apart. One of the reasons is because you know, other files in your program will want to include your class, pound include, so they can use it. And generally, you want them to include this header if you mix the header and the CPP together, um, I think the idea here is that the person using your class could just look at this, the heading, the H file, and they wouldn't know how all the methods were implemented. They would just see what their names were, or what the parameters were. That's what they're only supposed to need to know. So it kind of separates out the part that the, the users of your class shouldn't have to look at. In Java, there's no such separation. In fact, most languages just mush these two concepts together. If you have a class, you just make a .java file and you put all the code in there. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's kind of the direction that most languages decided to go. But C++ thought it might be nice to separate these two things. So whatever. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of the main separation of code. And I'll show you in a second like exactly what kind of syntax you write in each one of these files. But that you, we will, in all of our examples, we will have this pair every time we make a class. Okay. So here's what a class looks like. There's just a lot of muck and syntax on this slide, but I decided it would be easier to talk about if I just put everything all on the screen. So um, an H file begins with a couple of lines and ends with a certain line. These lines with these hash signs in front of them are called preprocessor directives. Um, they are kind of like the include statement where you, uh, you, you link one file to another. You know, What these lines do is basically they make it so that um, you avoid the multiple definition problem. So if you have two files in your, in your project that both want to use your class, they would both say that they want to include the class, include the .h for that class. The problem, though, is if you understand how that command works, is include literally takes the contents of that file and just pastes it right there. And so if you're not careful, what happens is they both paste in the declaration of the class. And so now the class is defined twice in your overall file, in your overall compiled project. And then the compiler doesn't like that. It says multiple definitions of the whatever class. It's dumb. It basically tries to construct a class twice. So we put this wrapper at the top and the bottom of our file. This basically says, like, if I have never like, included this file ever before, then I want to define this to be that and then end. Otherwise, nothing. So basically, this uh, top and bottom stuff here will make it so that you won't accidentally have multiple copies of your class get included. This is a stupid thing that you have to do because C++ is stupid. This is my uh, editorial about this language feature. But you, you got to do it. If you don't do it, you're going to have problems. There, there is a shorter version of this where you can say, like, 
pound pragma once, but that's not as compatible with certain compilers, so I'm not going to use that first. So anyway, you say if, if and def define and if. And uh, just to show you, we're going to write a class, just as a first example, we're going to write a class called bank account, bank account dot h. And so in here, I'm going to say like, you know, class bank account, bank account. And <clears throat> if, you, uh, if you go to a program that's like using the bank account class, you know, I, I, maybe you guys would already know, like a class is not usually a complete program. A class is a module, a, a library that can be used by other files to help solve a problem. So like uh, if you have a bank account class here, you might have some client program called Wells Fargo or something that wants to use the bank account. So you might say include bank account dot h, and then now that you've done that, you can say bank account b semicolon and that class now exists in this file because I included the bank account dot h. But if I say include bank account dot h two or three times, it should say redefinition of class bank account like you've got two copies of it. And a similar error would result if two different CPP files each included it once. So the solution is again what it said on the slide there, which is that I have this goofy stuff at the top where I say, if it's not defined bank account H, then I want to define bank account H to be this class, and then I say end to end the if uh, section. What is this underscore stuff? It's a preprocessor variable symbol. This could technically be anything. I could write lol Marty Steph hello here. As long as this one matches this one, it would work. The convention is to use a name that exactly matches your class name or your header name. So if it's foo.h, you say underscore foo underscore h or something like that. Why underscore? Because that way you won't mix it up with like some variable in your program or something like that. Okay, so now that I put that if and def thing and I recompile, it at least compiled now successfully, even though I included it multiple times. Basically, these next two includes didn't do anything because the if never entered at the top, okay? So that's the kind of shell of what goes around a class. Now, what goes inside of a class are constructors and methods and variables. And this probably looks pretty similar to Java except for a couple differences. One is that in Java, each individual member of a class, you usually write a specifier at the front of it where you say if it's public or private or whatever, right? In C++, you can have a public section of the class and a private section of the class. It's the same concept, same idea, totally the same meaning. It's just that you say public once and you write all the public stuff. And then you say private once and you write all the private stuff. You can actually switch back and forth. You can say public something, private something, public something. You can, you can switch as many times as you want, but it's more conventional to have one clump of public stuff and one clump of private stuff. Yeah? So, uh, do you have to use a public colon syntax or, 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 or can you do like Java where you say public with void or thing? Yeah, you have to do it this way with a colon. Yeah, it, it, I mean, if you wanted to pretend it was Java, you could literally write public colon in front of each of these things and it would kind of look like Java, but it would have to still have that colon. That's not very conventional, though. I think this is the way people normally do it. Yeah. And this is not like um, a name convention, an actual key. Right? Like in Python, for instance, you get two underscores. That's a private, but it's not really private. Right. There are some languages that use conventions to indicate things, but they're not technically enforced. As you say, Python language, if you name things in certain ways, you're hinting to others that this is meant to be public or private or something. Uh, although the language does not actually restrict or enforce that constraint, this really does enforce this. It, it, it has to be the word public, not whatever, not some other word. Like it has to be public colon. And I'll show in a minute if you make something private and then other files try to touch it, it will give a compiler error. So yeah, that's an important distinction. Um, now, otherwise, I think most of this syntax will be the same as Java syntax. If you want to write a constructor in Java, you say public class name. If you want to write a method in a class in Java, you say public void whatever, public int whatever. It's the same as if you just don't say public. Same for the, the, the member variables, the instance variables, the fields. You just would normally you would have said private int x or something. Instead, you say private colon and write all the variables out. Uh, one small thing about the syntax is at the end of the declaration of a class, you absolutely have to write a semicolon or else it doesn't work. <laughs> I, uh, when I was a young lad, I will say I lost more than an hour or two of my life hunting down missing semicolons that I forgot to put at the end of a class. One thing that's cool though, actually, I don't know if you noticed it, but when I started to type in Qt Creator, I actually typed a class 
like it, there's nothing in it, but I just type class bank account bracket enter and it put the semicolon for me. <laughs> so it's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, maybe you guys don't have the same emotional response to this that I have, but like I just, I lost like a day looking for a stupid semicolon after a class that I forgot to put. But anyway, you have to have a semicolon. Um, but in general, I would say other than the syntax differences, these commands do what you would think they would do, except you'll also notice that I've got semicolons here, right? So it's very much analogous to function prototypes that you guys have used all class long, that I'm just saying what's gonna be in the class here, and then in another file, a CPP file, I'm gonna actually write these with the curly braces and the, and the bodies and stuff, okay? Yep. Can you have private constructors? You yeah, you can have a private, because you can, I mean, basically any little thing that you've seen from Java, you can have static methods, you can have private methods, you can have private constructors, you can have all kinds of cool things. You know, most, pretty much everything is about the same. There's a few important differences I'm gonna try to show you, but frankly, most of the answers to like, can you do this or can you do that, like, it's probably a superset of what you could do in Java or Python, because C++, they didn't know when to quit, so they, they added every feature, even if it was evil. Um, <laughs> oh well, uh, yeah. Like if you watch Star Trek, the next generation, you'll know there's like an android data and then there's an evil android, Lore, and he's a bad guy, you know? And the difference is Lore was built first and he had more features. <laughs> like he had emotions, but then he learned to be jealous and spiteful and mean. So they made a new one, Data, that had no emotion. He was simpler, but he was later, he was the good one, he was the better one. You know, they learned from their mistake. This is lore. <laughs> this language has too much stuff in it and it's evil. Um, you'll see. End opinion, end rant. Uh, so that's, that's the dot H. So like a quick example would be here, a, a, a bank account. Um, every object has a name and a balance. So maybe for a second, a, a quick hack would be like, you could bank the variables in your public. That's not considered to be good style, but maybe that would let me play with that for just one second. Um, so, so if I go back to the cute creator, if I said public uh, string name, double balance, so that's like the person's name who has the bank account and the double is how much money they have. I don't know, you could have like a int ID, like an account number or something like that. You could have all kinds of fields. One thing I wanna point out is like, just like any other file, you know, if I'm using a string here, then actually I should say include string and if I want to call it string instead of std string, I should probably say using namespace std, right? So like all the same, C, see it's still C++, right? All the same rules apply here. Um, so now it, just with that only, you know, you'll notice I don't have any, uh, I was saying that the h file is the semicolons and then the cpp file is like the bodies, but I actually don't have any functions yet. I don't have any constructors or methods. So I actually technically don't need a cpp file yet. So just with that only, I can go here to the client, the thing that's using this. So I could make like bank account BA1. And then I could say BA1.name equals Marty. BA1.balance equals, you know, I've got five bucks or whatever. Bank account BA2. BA2.name equals Meron Sahami. BA2.balance, he's making a little more money than me, whatever, you know. So, um, I mean, I show, I show bank account in 106A when I teach that class, so if you took my A, it probably looks a little familiar to you, but like, I think a really important concept, I, I expect that you already know this, but I just wanna really make sure that everybody is thinking about this. The important concept here is like when you make a class, you're enabling a new type, a new type of variables, a new type of objects that the users, that the main, that the programs can make, can create, can use, right? And what's really important is that like if I make two of them, each one of them has a name inside of it. Each one of them has a balance inside of it. It's not like when I say bank account has a name that there's one string called name somewhere in the program. No, it's a template. Every time I make one of these, I get a name. Every time I make one of these, I get a balance. So like that's really important. That's what I call the instance concept. Each object you create is another instance of that template, another replica of all those things that you declared in the bank account.h file. Okay, I expect you already know that, but it's important to remember. Um, because like if I change this one's name, it doesn't change that one's name. They're separate, they're distinct from each other, right? Important concept. Okay, so even just with that, um, I have a little class, I ha it has little variables inside of it, right? But that's obviously incomplete. So let's, let's go a little farther. So, oh, here's a, here's a picture. I guess if you want a little picture, like on the little stack, it, a bank account object is basically a little blob of memory with enough space for a string and enough space for a, a double or whatever all the, all the member variables are, right? 
OK, fine. Kind of like we learned about structs last week. Basically, the same thing, just a couple variables lassoed together into one, right? OK, fine. So now, uh, let's talk about member functions. So if you, if you want to write member functions, you now suddenly have to write a CPP file. Member functions have exactly the same syntax as regular functions, except in front of the name of the function or method, you write the class name followed by two colons. <laughs> so like, this is a little weird. I, I think they might have messed up a little bit on this syntax. I'm just going to let you in on that a little uh, secret. Um, so look, let me show you. So over here in, uh, in bank account, <laughs> If you say, you know, you got like a name and a balance, like I think there should be a function called void deposit. You could deposit money into a bank account. So let's see, does it return? Does it have parameters? Well, maybe like double amount, you deposit a certain amount of money. And of course the idea would be however much money you pass here, I'll change the balance. It's just like adding to the balance basically, right? It's not meant to be very complicated, but when you, when you want to implement the body of the function with the curly braces, you go to the bank account.cpp file for that. So right now the bank account CPP is totally empty. Now usually the CPP and the H are the same except instead of semicolons you have curly braces, right? So you'd, you might imagine that you would do something like, you know, in the, in the CPP that you would paste the class but you would do like that or something, you know? But no, that's not what you do. Um, instead, you sort of take this. So, so wait, the first thing you do is your, your CPP file, you need to pound include your own H file Okay, <laughs> because your CPP needs to know about the declaration of the class whose bodies it is going to implement. So that's the first thing you got to do. Then the next thing you got to do is write all the bodies of all the functions. So you don't copy over the class header, you just copy over the method header like this, oops, uh, like that. And now you write it with, um, with curly braces. But you have to distinguish this from like just a regular old function called deposit. You have to distinguish, this isn't just like a global function called deposit, this is a method of a class, bank account class, called deposit. And the way that you distinguish that is right before the name of the function you write bank account colon colon deposit. <laughs> uh, I think that looks like complete shit, personally. <laughs> I don't like that syntax. That's how you do it. And if you have to write 10 bodies of functions, you have to put bank account pull in front, in front of each of the 10. So like, that's the syntax for these bodies. Um, so now, a really important thing about these member functions, and again, you probably understand this from taking A or whatever your previous programming experience, that these functions, these member functions, they operate inside of whatever object that you call them on, okay? So like, in general, I want the depositing function to increase the balance of the bank account. So if I come here and I say balance plus equals amount, it's a really important thing that what I mean by this is whatever object you call deposit on, change that object's balance by that much. And so there's this concept here that I call the object context. That like you have to understand that whenever this code is running, you are inside of a bank account object at that moment. And you can refer to the data of that object at that moment. And it will modify or use the data from that object. And that's different than just regular global functions which don't have that concept to them. So like for example, if I come over here to uh, this client code that, you know, this code that uses bank account, if I say ba deposit, you know, $12, it's really important to understand that when the deposit code is running that time, it's running on this object. So it's gonna modify this balance by $12, right? And down here, if I say ba2.deposit $1 or whatever, uh, maybe he gets his 9998 and he goes up to 99, whatever. At that moment, the deposit is running on this object, so it modifies this object's balance, right? So if you jump into the deposit code, I just say balance. I don't say ba1.balance or ba2.balance, just whoever I am, my balance should be changed, right? That concept of the code being part of an object is a really important concept, kind of prerequisite concept over this class. Yeah? But do you need to pass by reference though? Because like, you would be changing a copy of the object. Okay, right, so I think that, so the question if you didn't hear was like, do you pass the account by reference or what? Um, I would say that Thinking about those kinds of things can lead you astray because 
you don't really like pass the bank account as a parameter at all. Not by reference, not pointer, not by anything. Like when you call deposit, it sort of implicitly knows that this is the object of interest. So it's like passing itself. It knows who it is somehow. And we can talk about how it knows that if you really want, but like you don't like pass the object, the bank account, in any way. Your code doesn't do that. This this main that uses this, you don't do that. And in here, um, you know, you don't have to have to refer to yourself necessarily. Who am I? What parameter am I? Am I a reference? Am I a pointer? Am I a const? What am I? You just are. <laughs> you just exist. You are implicit in this code. Your identity as an object is implicit in this code. In fact, we sometimes call it the implicit parameter because it isn't stated in the code anywhere, but it is there. You know, this notion that deposit runs on me because I'm a bank account. Um, there is a way to refer to yourself in object code. Uh, if you've taken Java or Python or something, what, what do you usually say if you want to refer to yourself as an object? You know? It's called this. In Python, you sometimes say self, but that's just a convention. You can call it this if you want, I think. So in, in Java, you can say this dot balance. In C++, you can say this arrow balance, which is the same idea if you're familiar with that concept. So this means whatever object you call this function on. However, if you just say balance without that, it's implicit that you mean this balance, this object's balance. Because there's an arrow here, what do you know about this? It's a pointer. Its type is bank account star. So technically, the mechanism here is that when you say ba1 dot deposit, it sets this to point to ba1, and then it runs this code. <laughs> That's like what C++ does when you call a method on an object. But in general, you don't often need to write this because it's implied, okay? If you really want to watch the magic happen, you can like set a little breakpoint and run in the debugger. Uh, I forget what it'll show. I think it'll show good stuff. So it, my code paused right here. I've got two bank account objects. Uh, the other one has garbage in it because I haven't actually reached it yet. You might say, wait, why is this even here? I haven't even gotten down to this line. Why is it even there? Technically, C++ hoists these definitions up and leaves them as garbage until you reach the lines that initialize them, but let's just never speak of that again. Um, if you want to watch carefully, like, the first object is EOE and the second one is E11. So, like, if that's helpful, the memory addresses might be helpful for you to know which of these objects is which. Um, so I never set the ID. Look how it has a random garbage number in it because I never set it. So it's just, yay, garbage, C++, uninitialized variables. Um, so when I say deposit, if I jump into that call, now I'm in there. And look, this is that object. Do you see that? So if I say balance plus amount, 5 should be plus 12. So I get 17. And now I hit the brace, and so I go back. And now look, out here in main again, Marty's got the $17. But if I get to BA2, I declare that, I set the name to Maron, I set the balance to a lot of money, I call deposit on that. If I jump in there, remember EOE for Marty, E11 for Maron. If I jump in there, hey, this is E11, this is Maron, right? So I balance plus amount, it does 998 plus a buck, he gets up to there, I exit out. So I mean, I think. I think you guys get that already from, from your previous experience, but I just I really want to make sure that, that that's clear and that you've seen that before. And if you're curious about how some of these things work, I mean, you can step through them and watch it, watch it happen you know, in the debugger. OK. Uh, any, any questions so far about that? OK. Well, cool. I mean, mostly the new stuff here is the syntax. I would expect these concepts are mostly familiar to you. Um, OK, so like one of the reasons, you know, the classic thing students always ask is like, well, why do I want a deposit method? I could just say ba1.balance plus equals 12, right? That's all this does. What's the point of having a deposit method if it just adds a couple of numbers together? What's your response to that? Yeah? Encapsulation. Encapsulation. Okay. What do you mean? Like, what? Why is it better to do it this way? Um, if you force uh, user code to modify variables through method through member functions, those um, drop x and values, you can create um, security checks to make sure you're not doing bad values or. 
Yeah, I think that you've captured a lot of what I want to talk about, which is um, you said if I force the client, like this main person, to always talk to the object by calling methods on it rather than by directly touching its variables, then that will allow me to have some checks and some protections and some things on the object. Yeah, I think that's exactly the right idea. What's an example of a check I might want on a bank account? Non-negative, like, like maybe we have a withdraw. Like, like a pretty simple example would be, okay, I've got deposit. Let's also do withdraw. And I'll go to the H from the CPP and withdraw, withdraw, and withdraw is minus amount. Great, so that seems pretty simple. Okay, well, now um, I go back to the person, the client that's using it, and I say, actually, I want to withdraw $12. Oops, Marty doesn't have $12. So I won't want to let him do that. Now, if I'm allowed to say minus equals 12, I can't stop that double from becoming negative seven, right? But if I force them to use withdraw, then I could say something like, hey, well, wait a minute. You know, if your balance is big enough to withdraw that amount out, then I will uh, do that. But otherwise, I don't know, I could either print an error message, I could throw an exception, or I could just silently not perform the action. Now I can kind of protect this variable from being abused. Another check you might do is you might say, well, I don't want to allow them to, uh, you know, withdraw negative a dollar and it secretly deposits a dollar or whatever. You can, you can put whatever checks you think you need for your class. Um, that's, a, that's exactly the right idea, except of course the problem so far is that right now, I, even though this method does have those checks, I could just sidestep those checks by saying uh, balance equals negative seven, right? So, um, it still doesn't like stop me. So you use the word encapsulation, right? That's really how you totally stop a, a malicious client from doing bad stuff, right? And so how do you get encapsulation? Right. Yeah, you have to make the variables of the object private. That should be a, a review for you, right? So back here, you make your methods public and you make your variables <laughs> private like that. Now it won't allow them to do this. Of course, that means it also won't allow them to do this. And we wanted that. That was us like initializing the object. Oops. So it seems like we need an exception, a special case for like, I want to be able to set those values when I'm initializing a newly created object. How do you usually accomplish that? You write a constructor, right? So how do you write a constructor? In C++, you come back here and you say bank account. You pass me the string for your name and the double for your balance. Or maybe you just pass the name. I don't know. You don't have to pass me a balance. Maybe you start with no money, something like that. Um, so now in the, that's in the H file. And then in the CPP, I would write bank account, colon, colon, bank account, string name. And that, again, that looks a little weird, but it's like you just take exactly what it looks like in the H file, but you prefix the name by bank account, colon, colon. <laughs> so bank account, colon, colon, bank account. Um, yeah. So uh, then you would just say, well, if I, if I pass a name in as a parameter, I want to set the account to have that as its name, and I want to set it to have $0 <laughs> as its balance. So actually what you might do is, if this is called name, you might want to call this something different. So you might say maybe n. So uh, if this is n, you might say set my name to be n and set my balance to be 0. Uh, this constructor is like a method, like with deposit or withdraw, in the sense that it operates in the context of an object, that implicit parameter. In this case, the object is the object that's being born at that instant. So like, if you come back to, uh, to Wells Fargo, you would say bank account, in Java you would say bank account BA1 equals a new bank account, and then you'd pass Marty, it was something like that. That's the Java syntax, right? Um, in C++, you just delete the equals new type part. You say bank account BA1, Marty. That calls the constructor, passes Marty, and then stores the object that is created in that variable, bank account BA1. That syntax looks a little weird, but that's how you do it. Yep. Um, let's say I want the functionality in like my bank account object of having a constructor with one parameter for the name or using a constructor where you can include a bank and a starting balance. Can I do one constructor that has like a balance with like a, like a default value like you would do with functions? Or do that sure. You can say bal equals zero. All the, the usual function stuff should all apply here. I could pass an optional balance or if you don't pass one, you get a zero. So then over here in the CPP, you say double bal balance equals bal. Right? That works? Sure. 
So then I guess what I could do is I could come over here and there'd be a couple ways I could initialize a bank account. I could say bank account Marty and then I could say uh, BA1.deposit $5. That would get me up to my five bucks. Or here I could say bank account BA2 Maron Sahami comma this much money. So now he'll just start. I don't have to do two lines. Okay. So now I compile, everything compiles except over here I get an error on balance equals negative seven. It doesn't let me do it. The rule of private is your class, your file is allowed to see this thing and any other file, any other code is not. So private means the bank account methods, the bank account constructors can see it and change it and look at it and nobody else. Okay, yeah? Can you declare uh, a variable on one line and then use the constructor on another line? Uh, can you declare, oh, can you declare a bank account, but then not construct it until a different line? Yeah. yeah, in Java, you can sometimes do that. Bank account, B, semicolon, and then later you can say B equals a new bank account. No, um, C++, like, that's kind of more, if you wanted to do that, you'd have to do a pointer. Bank account pointer B, semicolon, and then you'd say B equals a new bank account, Marty. Um, so the concept of declaring a bank account, but you haven't initialized it yet, you can't really do that in C++. You have to initialize it as you declare it. Or if you don't want to initialize it, that's what a pointer is for. You would make a null pointer, and then later you would point it to a new so object. So you can't like, have an if statement which initializes it one way based on condition or another way based on another condition, because then? I mean, there's always ways around these things. But like, yeah, I mean, the style of that you're thinking of is more of a Java-ism. Like, C++ doesn't quite do it that way. Yeah, so that line is like, you declare it, you initialize it. It's ready to go. And you might say, oh, I don't like that. But I will say, you will have fewer bugs about uninitialized null objects in C++ because of this uh, pattern. So I don't know. There's pros and cons to everything. Did I just compliment C++? Ugh. <laughs> Dirty. Get it off me. Ugh. 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 What did you do, Mark? <laughs> uh, it won't happen again, I promise. OK, hey, so, so you, can't, you can't set the balance. That's great. Of course, the problem sometimes comes in where you, you might want to like print, like uh, see out, you know, my balance is ba1.balance endl. And it's like, oh, I can't print it. Well, but I don't want to change it. You don't need to protect me. I just want to print it out. So how do you get around that normally? Like a getter, uh, an accessing method that lets you see the balance but doesn't let you change the balance. So very frequently the way that you do this is you come here and you say double get balance. And so again, it returns the balance. So where? Here. I'm just alphabet. I like to have alphabetical order because I'm like that. Uh, so you say bank account get balance and you say return balance. So whatever object I am, return the value of my balance variable, but I'm returning it by value, therefore it's a copy, therefore you can't mess with mine. I'm sending, it's like a, I, the analogy here if, for this bank account get balance is like when you go to the bank and you deposit some money and they go, do you want a copy of your receipt with the balance on it? And you say, yes, that copy is get balance. If you tear that up, ha ha ha, you don't lose all your money, right? Or if you add an extra zero onto that thing, you don't get 10 times the amount of money, right? Because it's a copy, it's a, it's, a, it's a representation of that value. So like here in Wells Fargo, I could say ba1.get balance. And now it compiles and it works and my balance is, it says five because it's, uh, it didn't do the withdrawal there. Um, and so just to be clear, like if you say ba1.get balance minus equals seven, it doesn't let you do that because you're basically trying to say five minus equals seven. It's not reaching, it doesn't work. It's not a reference, so it doesn't let you do that. Okay? Yep? Does private actually protect the data in memory or does it just kind of hide it? Like if I return a pointer to the balance, would you be able to go in and mess with that? Yeah, um, that's a good question. The unfortunate truth is that private things only protect at the point of access. Like if you somehow knew the memory address of the balance, you could reach in there and fiddle with it, and it would let you do that. In fact, it's actually not very hard to figure out what the memory address of it is, because you just ask for the ampersand of BA1, and it's some number of bytes ahead of that. It's, you know, maybe the first field is right there, and the next field is four or eight bytes ahead of that. And so you actually, this is a problem that in C++, uh, private doesn't, or even const, doesn't necessarily mean that there's absolutely no way to modify that thing, but I will say, it protects you against most of the sort, like this is really the sort of thing you want, is I can't just directly reach and change the variable. <laughs> It'll be okay, I mean, 
if we don't give the user a pointer to the balance, we should be all right. If they're just reaching around to random memory addresses, then I don't know, they're already evil and they deserve what they get. So, uh, yeah, question. Is there any use case for having a private function? Sure, sure. I mean, I think uh, this example is meant to be simple so we can talk as a class. Most of the time you write bigger, more complicated, like go look at the starter code for homework. I'll write some giant file that's like a GUI and I'll have a bunch of functions in there that animate stuff or whatever and I don't necessarily want you guys calling all those functions. So I'll make a couple of like a boggle GUI homework for. There's a table on the spec that lists like five functions. Spoiler alert, there's more than five functions in the boggle GUI, but I made the other ones inaccessible to you because I don't want you guys messing around calling some method that I didn't want you to call. So yeah, I protect my code from your code basically. There's definitely a use case for a private function. Not, not really here, but in other examples there. Okay. So again, mostly review on the concepts, but the syntax of the C++ of it is the new stuff. Um, okay, so where are we? Where are we? Constructor, constructor, yeah, yeah. We, I skipped some of these slides, but uh, okay, let's see. Sometimes in a class, if the client is bad, you throw exceptions. Um, like we wrote that constructor where we took the balance parameter. Well, they could pass negative 10 right there. All of our deposit withdraw, they're trying to protect against negative numbers, but if we start as a negative number, that just starts us out in a bad state. So sometimes if you get bad parameters, you, you throw, because I, I won't be able to initialize, I guess I could set the balance to zero if it's negative, but a lot of times that means it's a bug in the caller, and so I want to tell them that they have a bug by throwing that balance right back at them. Be like if you went to the bank and you, you had like a negative $7 bill and you tried to deposit it and they like threw it at you and hit you in the face or something. I, I don't know, I don't know what the analogy is, but. You know, you, you go to your bank account uh, class and you say, uh, you know, if bal is less than zero, throw bal. You just throw it at them, okay? Okay, precondition. So what else, private data? Um, let's talk about const. So you can use the word const in a class. The meaning of const becomes more important and more complicated when you're dealing with a class. I think you already know what const means. It means constant, you can't change this thing. But there's at least three different ways you can use const in C++. You can just declare a variable that's const. That means that after you set its value, you cannot set it again. That's pretty understandable, pretty simple. You can also pass a parameter that's const, particularly a const reference, which would be like, here, here's my vector. You can look at it, but please don't change the elements. I'm passing it by reference, so I'm sharing my vector with you, but I'm not letting you uh, change it, right? Okay, fine. That's like you hand your, uh, your phone to your little niece or whatever, but you lock it so she can leave the FaceTime up and like say hi to grandma, but she can't like delete all your contacts or whatever, you know? It's like locked, but you can hold on to it and look at it for a minute. Then there's a third way, if you're writing a class, you can write a method to be const. And the syntax for that is you just write the word const at the end of the heading of the method. And the meaning of that is you as the author of the class are promising that the method, if you call the method, it will not change the state of the object. So if you look at our class, we have deposit and withdraw and get balance. Depositing and withdrawing, they change the balance. They change the state of the object that you call them on. They're mutators, they're modifiers, they change the object. This get balance doesn't, it just returns information. So you could say const here. You might say, well, why, what's the point? Do I have to say that? Well, I'll show you. I probably won't get to all of it until Wednesday, but by saying this, if somebody happens to declare a variable that is a const bank account variable or pass a bank account as a const bank account reference, it only allows you to call methods on it that have this const keyword on them. That's how it knows which methods are allowed and which ones aren't. So like over here, if I say that balance is const in the H, I also have to go back to the CPP and write it as const there. A lot of people mix those up. They forget to, they have, those have to be in sync with each other. Um, but now, so one, there's a couple things that happen when I say const here. One is if I try to do something that isn't consty, like if I say balance plus plus, it's like, hey, you promised you wouldn't do that. So it actually doesn't let me compile that. So that's cool. Okay, let's get rid of that. The other thing is back here in the client, if you call this, it knows that that method won't modify the bank account. So like here's an example, you might do something like uh, void do stuff, 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 do stuff to a bank account BA. You could do things to a bank account. Well, oh, I'll probably pass it, I should pass it by reference. But what you might do is you would say, well, I, I wanna make sure that the caller of do stuff knows I'm not gonna modify this. So I'll say const BA. Well, if you try to do stuff like this, BA deposit, BA withdraw, BA get balance, 
it won't let you do deposit or withdraw because it's like, hey, you insisted that I not change this object, but you're trying to change it. So const in the class restricts what ways that a, a client can use it if their parameter or their variable is a const variable. Okay? So that's kind of interesting. And in fact, if you look at the Stanford libraries like the vector class or the hash map class, if you look in there, Several of those methods are actually const. Uh, it's about time to go, but just as a last thing I'll show you, if you go to the documentation for the Stanford lib and you look up like uh, vector or something, where's vector? So if you look at these headings like void add, that makes sense, void clear. But then if you look at some of these methods like get, it says const, because you can get stuff out of a vector and it doesn't modify the vector. Insert isn't const. But is empty is const, so you can kind of do this calculation of am I changing this thing or not? If I'm not, I'm going to write the word const on there so the client knows it won't change the object. Okay, well, that's not everything that we want to say about objects, but I better stop for there. Good luck with your studying. I'll see you guys back here for Wednesday's class. Thanks.